arahato sambudasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambudasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambudasa homage to him the blessed one the worthy one the fully enlightened one sadhu 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 so welcome everybody we are going to uh, continue our in-depth study uh, into the Sigilavada Sutta. And the Buddha gave this Sutta as the advice for the lay people. And this has, we're in section two, section one uh, was basically about morality and the importance of it and how it works in life, how it assists you with your meditation. And then this one, section two and section three, we will do today. And the, um, the building and management of wealth is the second section. And the third section is protecting the assets and wealth. And then we can talk about this a little bit. So the first part is about the building of wealth. And I have a little outline I put here for you about what we're going to cover. So you can copy this if you want to before we start. Okay, so I'm going to give you the share screen. It should still be there. I'm sorry, my writing is obviously getting old. <laughs> but it's actually, it's writing on a computer screen. But part two is building wealth and managing wealth. And there's interesting the five four, five parts the to divide your money into five parts and it's uh it says four here but two of the parts are for investing in your own business and then uh one part is for the fruits of your work celebrating the fruits of your work and then it's another one is helping the needy and then the last one is one part uh for the misfortune that you set aside or that comes, uh, you want to have one part for that. And then in part three, the two pieces to note, there's some breakdowns in these that we're gonna go through, but part three is about protecting the assets and wealth. And it discusses six ways in detail uh, to avoid squandering wealth. And that's very important because we lose our money too quickly nowadays. So if you take a picture of that, I'm going to turn this off or we can come back if you want to, to write it again, but that's what we're going to cover. Okay. So here we are um, building wealth. And this is a very good one. Have a nice little hand up there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Building wealth. One who is wise and uh, morally upright shines like a fire on a hilltop. He or she builds wealth patiently bit by bit, like the way that bees gather their honey. And in this way, riches will be steadily accumulated like an anthill that grows higher and higher. So this is how doing things gradually if you go gradually, you go slow, everything happens in a very solid way and it will last for a very long time. If you hurry up and you, you, you want a whole lot to come really fast and happen, then you have a problem with whatever's happening for it to be lasting. And this applies to many, many different things that we try to do in life as well as our money. It works that way too. I remember in uh, investing when I was working with my mother's estate a long time ago, and uh, someone was teaching me about the way this works with investing. And you think I have, uh, who makes more money? The person with $10,000 who puts it and invests it all at once, or the person who takes the $10,000 and they break it down into how much they're going to put in every month or every two weeks, they're going to put a little more in. And the investments are going like this, you see like this and this, going like this on the chart. And the guy, the one that did it incrementally is the one who almost always makes more money 
unless there's a freak thing that happens and you get a five time payback on the 10,000 you just put in there, or you can just lose it, <laughs> you know? So this is something to consider how you're dealing with it. So this is how investment was sitting there in, in reference to the bees and in reference to the anthills. They're steady, they're systematic. They set up the design and they keep working steadily all the time. And that's what needs to happen over a period of time to be very highly successful. So managing wealth, one who builds wealth in this way is ready for family and household. The wealth should be divided into four parts so that he or she will always have good friends and they will have a favorable life. So now one part should be spent and enjoyed as the fruits of the work that you're doing. And then one fourth of it, perhaps you should use a portion to help the needy and less fortunate because whatever you put out, you get back. And someday if you're poor and needy, you would like people to help you. And if you're helping them, you're planning ahead. And this comes back to you through the universe in many, many ways. But we help with an open heart. It turns around that somebody's there to catch us when we fall. And then um, two parts of it should be used to, to conduct or invest in your own business. Okay, and then one part you should save in case of misfortune. This is what his advice was. Now the wealth should be accumulated in accordance with right livelihood and in the Eighth Noble Eightfold Path, which means that occupations involving any killing or the sale of animal flesh or the trading uh, in human beings, weapons, poisons, intoxicants should be avoided. Eth unethical and illegal form of livelihood should also be avoided. The Buddha praised the upright and wise who observe right livelihood in the process of accumulating their savings and wealth. Very interesting is the Buddha's advice that wealth should be built up patiently and gradually. How appropriate this advice is, because especially in these modern times where we frequently see fortunes that are being made and lost very, very quickly in risky financial ventures. So many people being duped and swindled out of their savings by shady get rich quick schemes that's happening today and we have to be very careful a person who builds up his or her assets slowly and patiently is usually more stable and therefore more prepared in settling down and starting a family the wealth accumulated should be divided into four parts and used as follows. One part should be spent on ourselves and our family. That's the first part we mentioned with a portion for charitable purposes, if you desire. Two parts should be used to maintain and grow our wealth, such as by investing in our business so that it will remain viable and continue to provide a constant and ample flow of income. And in the modern context, these two parts may perhaps be used to invest in a stable long-term investment plan. The last part should be set aside as savings for a rainy day. Misfortune can strike at any time and we should always be prepared for it. So these are all particularly good reminders as we are nowadays constantly bombarded by the media fueling our greed for easy wealth and making us crave for frivolous 
expensive and ultimately useless possessions. Because of this, many people spend unwisely and get into excessive debt, which results in financial difficulties and collapse. And this, of course, will likely lead to domestic and marital problems and bankruptcy, such as bad problems in relationships. And thus, while the Buddha's advice on managing wealth may appear simple and conservative, it can be used as a guide, which if it's followed, will have a significant and a very positive impact on the financial well-being of most people, eventually leading to lasting prosperity and a happier life for self and family too. Now, this part of the teaching appears later on in the Sigalavada Sutta, but it's been placed here in the front of, of when we're talking about this, so that the teachings of wealth in sections two and three that we're gonna show you are grouped together for easier understanding. So now we see that going slow, steadily, continuously, evolves into a solid something that will hold up and last longer. Honestly, it sounds like the houses for the three little pigs. <laughs> we had the three little pig stories when I was growing up in the house of straw, house of sticks, and the house of bricks. And the wolf was coming. And what are the three little pigs going to do? They're going to all help together and build the first little house very quickly because that one is the house of hay and you know of hay and straw so they did it very quickly and that little pig he went to stay and the second little pig that he wanted to build from sticks he was sure sticks would be just fine and then they rushed around and they helped him to build the house of sticks the third little pig it took them a little bit longer but he built his house of bricks he called many of the critters from the forest to come, many from the critters of the farm to come, and all of them were working really hard to build this house because they didn't want the wolf to come in and get him. So then the little pig went back and he stayed his house of straw, and the little pig went back and he stayed in his house of sticks, and the other one went back and he stayed in his house of bricks. And then came the wolf and the wolf said, little big, little big, let me come in so that I can have some fun within. <laughs> and he broke down that house of straw, but the little pig ran out the back and went to the house of sticks. And then came the wolf again. Little pig, little pig, let me come in. Knock, knock, knock. Let me come in now or I'll blow your house down, he said. Let me come in. And they squealed and squealed and they went out the back, ran away to the house of bricks. But then what happened? When they got to the house of bricks, he would huff and puff and he would try to blow that house and he couldn't do it. He would huff and puff and try to blow it down again. He couldn't do it. There was no way he could get that house of bricks. It took longer to build. They, they kept doing it steadily the whole time that they were building the straw, building the sticks, but they rock, the last one was the bricks. And then by golly gosh, gee whiz, he couldn't get in. He just went away to another place. <laughs> and then they danced around and celebrated. But the pig said, it's because I took my time. I did it right. Nothing broke down, couldn't get in the windows, couldn't get in the doors, couldn't blow my house down. That's why long, slow, steady pays off. Steadily doing it. Second part of this story is protecting the assets and wealth. Once we have the assets and wealth, six ways of squandering wealth to avoid indulging in alcohol and drugs, which cause loss of self-control. That's the thing about that fifth precept, you see. That's the one, because if you take any kind of 
substance that blurs the mind, then the other four precepts get broken. But here we're talking about money. So overspending and immediate loss of wealth. That's number one. Increased quarreling and hostilities with people at work, with people at home. Susceptibility to illness and disease when you are dealing with drugs and alcohol. Unsavory and bad reputation in the community. There's another one. Shameless behavior and indecent exposure can occur. And foolishness and weakened intellect. You can't work as well. You can't read as much. You can't understand things and comprehend things. And you get mixed up. And it's really bad. Next one is roaming the streets, staying out late at night. That is something that cannot end well these days. Being vulnerable to danger. Spouse and children are exposed to risk when you are not there. How the home is unprotected and insecure. The being is suspected of crimes in the community the moment something happens. Being subject to rumors and gossip, which can ruin your reputation. And meeting with many troubles in the community. The next section we just talked about is the frequent partying and always looking for entertainment. A lot of that goes on. Leisure and having a good time are fine in moderation for a celebration. However, an individual used to frequent partying and entertainment will always be thinking and following them uh, in the following manner to the detriment of the family and to their work. It becomes self-destructive. Where's the dancing, they say? Where's the singing? Where's the music? Where? what's on the movies, who, who's in the shows, and all of this type of addiction of getting overly involved, excess. Next one is compulsive gambling. Winners are resented and then even hated. Losers grieve over the losses and regret their actions with restlessness, guilt, and remorse. Savings, hard-earned wealth, and inheritances are lost quickly. One's word is considered less reliable in public or in court. One is held in disdain and contempt by friends and relatives. One is not sought after as a marriage partner. The big one. Associating with bad company is the next one. Befriending and associating with rogues, people who come and trick you and go away with the money that you thought you were a partner with that person and they leave you cold with nothing. Befriending and associating with drunkards who are unreliable in what they tell you and lie, on, oh, gracious, lie all the time, and befriending and associating with drug addicts and the alcoholism and uh, the addiction to alcohol, addiction to drugs is the same thing. It drifts off into a level of lies and deceit. Anything they can do to get what they want to have when you need it in the body instead of withdrawing. Befriending and associating with cheats and swindlers, groups of people who come, oh, my favorite one, was in a very hot area, a country town was swindled by a group of people who came and convinced them they could build a ski resort on a mountain when these people didn't have much snow in the winter at all, but they convinced these people to give them their money to build a ski lodge on this one small mountain in their area. But they didn't have enough snow, but this 
money was enough to pay for a snowmaking machine. They convinced them of everything and absconded with all that money over a million dollars and just disappeared. Befriending and associating with thugs and ruffians, tough people who will make you pay to protect your property um, and embezzle you, take money from you and trick you, that sort of thing. The next section is about being idle and lazy, having lots of excuses for not working. Oh, it's too cold. It is too hot. It is too late. It is too early. Being too hungry, being too full, duties and responsibilities are neglected. One is unable to accumulate wealth and is incapable of supporting themselves or the family and any misfortune and savings will soon dwindle away as well as they desperately try to correct the course that they've taken. And so most of these points are self-explanatory. But a special mention should be made about the intoxicants again, because the Buddha advised very strongly against such substances and many times in, in this discourse and in other important teachings too. He mentions this, and this is especially relevant today as we see so many people, regardless of demographics, rich or poor, famous and obscure, causing themselves and others enormous harm by abusing alcohol and illegal drugs. And furthermore, frequent and excessive drinking is usually accompanied by a host of other expensive and usually immoral and unhealthy activities, which lead to many other personal health and financial problems. And so also drinking, uh, drunk driving and tra uh, drug trafficking are these days among society's most dangerous and destructive crimes in almost every area in every country, regardless of the region this is happening. So there are six sure ways of losing our wealth and savings that we just mentioned. Engaging in these activities will have many other harmful consequences for both the individual and society too. A rational person would surely wish to protect what he or she has worked for so hard to build up. Financial stability will be assured by simply avoiding these six activities. It's a very clear cut program. Peace and happiness will follow and so will prosperity. So then he goes into talking about what's coming from several different suttas into one place. In summary, although there may be many good time friends, oh, there's always good time friends and people who outwardly proclaim their friendship a true friend is one who remains close by in times of hardship. And these things come, a lot of these little pieces are coming, mentioned in the Dhammapada in different places. One will be ruined by these six things, sleeping late, adultery, hatred, aimlessness, harmful friends, and extreme stinginess. One will suffer not only in this life, but also in the next, if he or she has evil friends and companions and spends time doing evil things. One will be destroyed if he or she indulges in the following six things, gambling and promiscuity, drinking and being obsessed with singing and dancing, sleeping by day, aimless wandering at unseemly hours at night, 
keeping harmful friends and utter stinginess. One who takes delight in gambling, drinking, adultery, associating with low life and as avoiding the wise will surely go to waste. One who goes from place to place, drinking and becoming the drunkard will sink quickly into debt, become poor, then homeless, bring disrepute to his or her family. One cannot maintain a proper home life and family by always sleeping until very late, rising when it is night, or always being intoxicated. One who continually gives excess excuses not to work and leave things undone will miss out on opportunities to do well. One who is not greatly affected by difficulties in work, who does not look for excuses to avoid work, one who fills his or her responsibilities will always enjoy happiness. So this concludes these two sections, talking about the wealth and function and planning. He covers all the different angles in mentioning in the prose when we read the sutta, mentions much of this as you go through the sutta. These things are problems in our society because of the competitiveness and the, the doctrine of acquisition. When we hear it talk about such things as music or art, one of the things that's happening in uh, Buddhism today is going overboard thinking if it says, don't do these things, we won't do them at all. You are not monks, okay? You are not monks. We're nuns that are going to stay completely away from this, you see? And it doesn't mean you are to embrace the extreme of when you hear about these things, except in common sense, don't, don't halfway kill something, but you know what I'm saying? You don't embrace these things, but things such as music and happy celebrations and dancing, uh, folk dancing and cultural dancing and getting together without intoxicants, without drugs, celebrating, a big celebration. India does not have trouble having big celebrations. <laughs> That's one thing. It's really true. Um, you do not cut things out totally. You use common sense. It's craving and clinging is the core piece that is the problem for the individual to become habitual in the patterns of behavior that are harmful and hurting the person that's what's true so one man came to me once in an interview and he said sister i figured it out we had the lesson on dependent origination last night and i figured it out i said well what did you figure out he said you see contact happens, then feeling, and then craving. So I am just deciding I am not going to feel anything anymore. <laughs> the problem with this is that feeling, arising feeling, is part of your human system. Question was, did the Buddha have any painful feelings as an arahat with fruition? Hmm. Yes, he did. And there's a record of him once turning over the evening Dhamma talk to another monk to give the talk so that he could change his position and rest his back. Why? Well, because in a past lifetime, they say he was a wrestler and he used to use a kidney punch in this hurt the person by the, in the kidney with 
the fighting. And this came down as a karmic thing to him across a remaining karma to burn off. And but he physically in this lifetime, it was very simple. It goes beyond burning off karma. Okay. He had this injury from before and he was getting old. And this happened when he was in like his late seventies or, you know, before he died, I think at 80. Right. So it was near the older years in that period of time, he had back pain. So he, wanted to lie down flat and rest to ease the pain and release it see so he had pain so somebody said to me well how can that be i said because you have to look at what's happening to the person in the cycle of dependent origination and then what is left after you talk about that um cycle what is left Okay, for the person when they become high enough that they are in arhatship, what is left of them? So if you wonder about that, you want to look at that? Do you want to look at that? You can look at that for just a second. Because I mean, I some people don't realize this, you see? So here we are. And I, I probably have my pictures in there somewhere, but I don't, I can't go to them. So I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to erase this and I am going to type these lists up for you. I just didn't get to do it today. So I'm going to get, get it up and email it to you, but let's take, let's clear this off and let's just play with this a minute. Okay. And so if you have a wheel like this, it's a bad wheel, isn't it? Well, okay, let's try one more time. <laughs> okay. There you go. And this wheel, it's going to be your dependent origination wheel. Okay, and so here you have ignorance. Formations. Consciousness. Mentality, materiality. Six base contact feelings craving clinging. Habitual tendency, that means your habitual tendency for reaction. This is bawa, right? Birth of, we're going to say it's an untrained mind. So it's birth of reaction. And then, of course, this one is sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief despair okay sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair it's aging and death sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair so now when you become an arahat let's look at what happens okay so you understand so obviously ignorance is gone but the human being still has Formation. So we're going to put a check on the ones we need. Formations. They still have consciousness arise, right? They do have consciousness inside. They have mentality, materiality. The nama rupa is still operating in the human being. They have six sense base. And because of that, they can have 
contact happen. And with contact, as conditioned feeling arises, a feeling can happen. Now, with the Arahat, there's no more ignorance and there's no more craving. He, he's cooled, completely chilled. He's cool. And there's no more craving. Therefore, there is no more clinging. And clinging as conditioned habitual reactions, habitual tendencies happen. He has no more habitual reactions at all. He's totally in imperturbable mind, highest level of equanimity, balanced mind. And he does not have any more birth of reaction, but he does have birth of actions doesn't he? <clears throat> so he has a birth of action. But then he does not have any more sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. Be why? Because he totally understands something. He understands that in life, pain for the human being is inevitable. That means it will always happen to the human body, the brain, everything, the pain will happen. However, he knows that suffering is optional. Yeah, optional. Do you have to suffer with everything that occurs? No, if you learn how things work, and you understand Atta and Anatta correctly, then you will understand all things are impersonal. They are impersonal. And so the, when they are impersonal, it is not me, it is not mine, it is not myself, it is just what is happening. And because you know the you you know he knows these facts, impersonal nature of everything. He also knows that Anicca is real. And he knows what Atta, how Atta, he understands Atta Anatta totally and completely. He has the Anatta perspective, impersonal perspective of life, everything. But this one, he knows the secret of craving was Atta. And that's what the Buddha left you to figure out. It's not talked about that way. It is talked about as um, identity and non-identity. Identity is Atta. Non-identity is um, Anatta. Uh, personality, Atta. Impersonality is uh, anatta. And we take those words that we see so often as um, uh, personality. And we say, what's the root word here? Personal. And we say, everything is personal. That means I believe I was raised to think everything was me, it was mine, it is myself, it is who I am. It is so severe, this problem, so very severe, that everything somebody sees, hears, smells, tastes, senses, touch, sensation, or th thoughts arising, must be me, mine, who I am, myself. And if we believe that, what will happen next? By taking it that personally, we will believe it is my fault. We believe I am to blame. We will believe it is happening to me, everything. But the other choice is um, anatta, right? And we say impersonal, the impersonal. So if the perspective I choose to live my life with 
I keep it impersonal. Therefore, I can begin to practice that until my brain understands I'm going to look at everything in my life as being impersonal and just what is happening as it happens in the present time. If it is impersonal, it is not me, it is not mine, it is not myself, it certainly is not who I am, therefore it is not my fault, I am not to blame, but I, if I did something wrong, I broke my precept, I will, I'm sorry to myself, I'm sorry to the other person, take my precepts again, start again. Until your brain gets it. That's what you're doing, teaching your mind, teaching your mind the whole time. So this anatta perspective becomes a way, anatta perspective becomes a way of looking at the world, okay? So the Buddha has the impersonal nature secure in his mind and nature is secure in his mind. Impersonal perspective is cure, secure in his mind. His suffering is optional. He's not going to buy it anymore. It's really completely in his brain, totally and completely, you see? Now, let's get rid of some of this over here. Let's get rid of this stuff for a minute and show you what's left of the arahat. So what's left of him, right? Okay, so we're gonna make another wheel here. Here's the arahat wheel. Oh, with an eraser. That's no good. <laughs> okay. I love this. Here we go. Okay. So now we have definitely he has one formations, consciousness, mentality, materiality. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then he has seven, right? Seven. And then he has uh, no sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. So he's permanently lost his ignorance, his full knowledge and comprehension of how everything works, totally automatically operating inside him. And he no longer is going to be had craving, clinging habitual tendencies operating. He's only going to be responding at all, mostly teaching. <laughs> okay, so here's one, two, three, four, five, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, and one, six, and seven, right, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, so he has formation, consciousness, mentality, materiality, sixth sense base, contact. He has feelings, feeling come up. So he has pleasant feeling or painful feeling or neutral feeling. Yeah, okay, but not so much neutral, but it's pleasant or painful. That's fine. It's just that there is no more um, reaction. So there's just action here that occurs. And this is an action. This is actually response. Response, okay. And the response takes the place of reaction, no more reactions anymore. And so this becomes the Buddha's wheel. This is his wheel like this. See? And that's how your arahat is. And it's the truth, he knows that pain is inevitable for happening in life. We cannot stop it from happening in our body, but Suffering is optional. And I always think when the tree fell on me, I just lay there and started reciting suttas. <laughs> There's a lot of pain, but you know, time to recite the suttas and practice. 
So let me open up this to questions and see what you think about all of this with the with the money and investments. Do you think it's on target? What do you think? Does it make sense to you? Definitely. 